Hello, welcome back. Today we're going to be wrapping up phonetics. Here's where we're at so far in our study of phonetics. Remember, we have this concept of a phone. A phone is a unit of sound in speech, and we've discovered that phones can be analyzed into these things called phonetic features. For consonants, the phonetic features are place of articulation, manner of articulation, and voicing. You can think of these phonetic features as kind of like little instructions that tell you how do you pronounce the sound. If you specify the place of articulation, the manner of articulation, and the voicing, that tells you how to produce the sound and how to classify the sound. We studied vowels. Vowels also are composed of phonetic features, but it's a different set of features. For vowels, the phonetic features are tongue height, tongue position, and lip rounding. So you specify these three features, maybe some other ones, and that tells you how to pronounce a given vowel. And here's the International Phonetic Alphabet, the official chart of the alphabet. This chart contains all the features of all the symbols which define the common sounds, the common phones, that you're going to find across languages. Let's just review vowels and the vowel features a little bit. So remember, the y-axis here represents the feature of tongue height. That's how high your tongue is in your mouth when you're talking. The x-axis here represents your tongue position. Is your tongue towards the front of your mouth, or is it towards the back of your mouth? So I would like for you, following along at home, to try to name the features of the highlighted vowel here. So how would you describe this vowel? Think first, what's the tongue height, then the tongue position, then the rounding? Well, we see from the chart that it's on the left, so it's unrounded. We see that it's low, and we see that it's back. So this is an unrounded low back vowel, and it's pronounced ah, ah, ah. This is what the doctor asks you to say, ah. The reason the doctor asks you to say this is that the tongue height is as low as it can be, and that forces you to open your mouth as far as you can, and then the doctor can look down your throat. Now, how about this one? It's pronounced I, but what is it? Well, we see that it's unrounded. We see that it is high, although it's not as high as something like E or U. When we see that it's front, although again, it's not as front as something like E. So we would say this is an unrounded high front lax vowel. Remember, lax just means it's a little bit towards the center of the vowel space, and that's an important feature in English vowels, not in all languages. How about this one? This one's a little bit weird. We don't have this in English, and uh, it's actually a pretty rare sound across languages. So first of all, is it rounded or unrounded? Well, it's on the right, so that's right. It's rounded, and it's low, and it's front. So this is a rounded, low, front vowel. So this is going to be, well, if you want to pronounce this, first start with the unrounded low front vowel, which is ah, 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 and then round it, and you get uh, uh, uh. So that's what that symbol indicates. And this thing in the middle, you should remember this one. This one is special. This symbol has a special name. Do you remember what this is called? It's called schwa. This is your unrounded mid-central vowel. This is where your tongue is just in the very middle of the vowel space. It's not constricted at all. This is the vowel which takes like the least energy for you to produce. It's just the most lazy sound possible. It's just uh. It's just uh. That's a schwa. Now, we can also take these vowels and we can add features to the symbols in order to indicate even more unusual different kinds of vowels. Remember that when we were looking at consonants, we saw that we could do something like we could add a tilde on top of a consonant symbol in order to make it nasal. We could add a sort of bracket under a consonant to make it dental. We could add a circle under it to make it unvoiced. Well, you can do the same thing with vowels in order to describe all kinds of different vowels that you might find. For example, this. So the symbol here is a, the symbol is ash, so that's the low front unrounded lax vowel in English, a, but I've drawn this circle under it. 
remember what the circle means. It means it's unvoiced. So this would be the vowel, an unvoiced a sound. That is an unvoiced, unrounded, low front lax vowel. We could also add the nasal sign. If you draw a tilde above any IPA symbol, that means you're making it nasal. In this case, we have a vowel which is a mid back unrounded vowel. So that's going to be something like uh. We're making it nasal with the tilde, so we get uh. That would be what we call a nasalized, unrounded mid back vowel. And we can add lots of symbols in order to describe all these different possible sounds. So this would be, well, first of all, what is the Y? It's a rounded high front vowel, U. Now we are unvoicing it, so we have And then we're going to nasalize it, so we have some kind of very odd sound. It's unlikely you would find that kind of a sound in a language. Why do you think that might be the case? Well, here it is again. It's kind of hard to hear what that is, right? So it's unlikely that a language is really going to use this sound because, remember, language is used for communication. That's one of the core properties of language, communicativity. If you use this sound in your language, people are not going to be able to just hear which vowel you're saying. So the actual vowels you find in a language are determined by some trade-off of how much you can communicate and how difficult it is to pronounce things. It's unlikely you're going to get a sort of exotic vowel like this thing here. But it's still important that we're able to describe that kind of vowel if we ever do encounter it. And it might be the case that in pronunciation, in the actual pronunciation of a word, you might end up producing a vowel like this, even if it's not an official sort of sound of your language. That's the kind of thing we're going to get to when we get to phonology. So we are almost done with the International Phonetic Alphabet chart. We've now completely covered consonants, and we've covered vowels, and we've talked a bit about the diacritics. The diacritics are listed down here. The diacritics are the extra doodads that you add below or above or on the side of a symbol in order to modify the features of that symbol. So they allow you to specify sounds that don't have their own symbols, like the unvoiced alveolar nasal, which we talked about, the na sound. And it also allows us to describe someone's speech with higher and higher levels of detail about the pronunciation. So if you want to really describe the sound someone's producing, you would probably have to use a lot of these diacritics, because if you very carefully analyze the actual sounds people are producing, you find there's a lot of little details. A lot of things end up nasalized or aspirated or whatever. And so you can describe what someone is saying in a almost on a really unbelievable level of detail using all of these diacritics. We call a broad transcription a transcription of the sounds which only gives the most important details about the sounds. So if I'm transcribing someone's speech phonetically and I only use like the IPA symbols and only a few diacritics, that would be a broad transcription. A narrow transcription is when we include as much detail as humanly possible, every little doodad every little phonetic aspect of what someone is saying. And we're actually going to be doing narrow transcriptions later in the class when we get to phonology. Right now, everything I've shown you so far is what we would call a broad transcription. But this is a spectrum. There's like the most broad transcription and the most narrow transcription, and anything you would actually do is somewhere in between those. So I'd like to talk now about something a bit new, which is syllables. So far we've been thinking about individual sounds, but you might have noticed speech does not consist of an individual sound. You rarely open your mouth and just say one phone. You rarely just open your mouth and say n. Rather, speech consists of a sequence of phones arrayed out in time, and these sequences of phones are organized into a unit, into units called syllables. So we've been covering discrete speech sounds, individual speech sounds. Now we're going to think a bit about how those sounds are concatenated together to form a chain of sounds that you're producing in order in speech. What happens when we start combining phones in speech? This is also taking us a little bit towards phonology, which is the structure of sounds in a language. And what are the ways in which these sounds can combine together to form 
speech. So you can't just sort of grab a whole bunch of random sounds from the IPA and string them together and think that you're going to get out uh, something which could actually be pronounced, right? So there's certain limits on what sounds we can put next to each other if we want to get something that we can actually pronounce. So speech consists of a sort of alternation of consonants and vowels, and these form units that are called syllables. A syllable is a unit of sound, which consists of two parts. It consists of the first thing, which is an onset, and the second thing, which is a rhyme. A syllable consists of two parts, an onset and a rhyme. Here's an example. So what this chart says here is a syllable consists of an onset and then a rhyme. In a word like cats, the onset is the consonant k, and the rhyme is everything else in the syllable. So it's the vowel a, and then the consonant t, and then the consonant s. So the onset is k, the rhyme is ats, the syllable, those two things together, is cats. Another example would be the word skin. The onset near how, now the onset has two consonants, has s and then k, and then the rhyme consists of the vowel i, and then the consonant n. So you get sk in, the syllable is skin. So an onset is always a sequence of consonants. An onset is a sequence of consonants, no vowels in the onset. You can identify an onset because it's just a sequence of consonants at the beginning of a word or a syllable. A rhyme, the second part, that part actually breaks into two further parts. So a rhyme consists of something called a nucleus and then something called a coda. A nucleus is a vowel. Now, it's usually a vowel. In a few minutes, we're going to talk about cases where the nucleus is not a vowel, but the nucleus is usually a vowel. And the coda is consonants. So in these examples, we have the first example is cats, the onset is k, the nucleus is the vowel a, and the coda is those consonants t and s. So you have k, a, and t, syllable is cats. In skin, the onset is sk, the nucleus is the high front lax unrounded vowel i, and the coda is the consonant n. So a nucleus is a vowel, usually, and a coda is a sequence of consonants. And that's the structure of a syllable. A, your speech consists of a sequence of these syllables. Each syllable consists of an onset followed by a rhyme. Each rhyme consists of a nucleus followed by a coda. This is the basic organization of sounds in speech. So let's do some examples of syllabic analysis. Here's a word. By now, you should be able to read this phonetic transcription and sound it out and tell me what the word is. So it starts with a dental fricative, an unvoiced dental fricative. We have th, and then we have the vowel i, then we have the consonant, the velar nasal ng, then we have the velar stop k, we have think. It's the word think in English. All right. What's the syllabic structure here? So remember, the syllable consists of an onset and a rhyme, and the rhyme consists of a nucleus and a coda. The onset is the consonant th. Remember, onset is always a sequence of consonants. You sort of track the consonants up until you hit the vowel. That's how you identify the onset. The nucleus is the vowel i, the high front lax unrounded vowel in English. The coda is the consonant cluster, the sequence of consonants ung followed by k. Here's another example, the word spy. What's going on here? So the onset, think about what the onset is. What is the onset here? Remember, the onset is the thing at the beginning, and it only consists of consonants, and so it's going to be all the consonants up till you hit the vowel. The onset is sp, the two consonants s and then p. The nucleus would be then the vowel, the diphthong i. And what's the coda? Well, the coda is empty. There is no coda. There is no consonant that ends this thing. And so we say this thing has an empty coda. The coda consists of the empty sequence here. A few more examples, and these are going to make things a bit more complicated. How would you pronounce this? We start with the diphthong A. We end with the consonant T. So it's eight. 
Well, that actually corresponds to two different words, at least in English. There's two different ways of spelling the sound corresponding to two different words in the language. And let's do the syllabic analysis. So what is the onset? Well, it's empty. There is no onset. We start with the vowel. We start with a diphthong. The onset is empty. The nucleus is the vowel A, the diphthong A, and the coda is the consonant T. Here's another example. Mars. This could be the planet Mars, or it could be like there's someone named Mar, and you're saying this is something that belongs to Mar, so this is Mars. Those are two English words which are both pronounced in this way, indicated with these phonetic symbols, m, a, r, z. So syllabic analysis, the onset is the consonant M, the voiced bilabial nasal. Then the nucleus, what's the nucleus? What's the nucleus here? It's gonna be the vowel A. Ah. Coda is the consonant R, er, the voiced alveolar approximant. Remember, this is a sound which is somewhat unusual in the English language. This is our R sound, R, er, followed by Z, Mars. So that's some syllabic analysis. I'd like to talk now about cases where the nucleus of a syllable is not a vowel. And you might think this is something exotic, but in fact, English has this all over the place. Here's an example. Think about the word button, and let's think about the second syllable in the word button. First syllable is but, second is n. What is that syllable? It's just n. What is the constant, what is the nucleus? of that syllable. Remember, a nucleus, I said, is a vowel. So what is the vowel in the second syllable there? N. Mm. There's no vowel. If you listen to it very carefully, you'll hear there's no actual vowel there. You just go directly from the T into the N. Button. Another example would be the word fur. So if you say this quite slowly in American English, you'll notice that it starts with, an, with a F, so the onset is the consonant F, the unvoiced labiodental fricative F, F, and then it goes directly into the sound er, fur. You go directly into the consonant er without a vowel in between. So we've seen that somehow these words seem to have nuclei, they seem to have syllables where the nucleus is not a vowel. What is this? So nasals and approximants and actually all consonants, but typically only nasals and approximants can be what we call syllabic. A syllabic consonant is a consonant that serves as a vowel within a syllable nucleus. So for example, fur, this word fur, if we were to do a syllabic analysis of this, the onset would be f. The nucleus would just be the consonant er with this little mark under it. The little mark under it means it's a syllabic consonant and the coda is empty. Another example of this would be like the word chasm. So you would give a phonetic transcription of this that looks like this, chasm. There's a mark under the M, which indicates that in that second syllable, which is zum, in that second syllable, the nucleus is actually the consonant, M. Simple, another example, if you say it slowly, that second syllable there, pull, the vowel, the quote vowel, really the nucleus of that syllable is actually the consonant O the voice lateral alveolar approximant. This is another interesting example. You should try to read this. Remember the funny R symbol there? The funny R symbol indicates a flap, a flap like R. So what we have here is ladder, ladder. The second syllable there is R, where the vowel is the, where the nucleus rather is the syllabic consonant R. So this is the word ladder, like the thing you climb up. Also, um, in many dialects of English, this would be how you pronounce the word ladder, as in former and ladder. Here's another one. Try to pronounce this. It's just sound by sound. And it is butter. Start with b, vowel is a, uh, consonant r, uh, and then you have consonant, syllabic consonant r, uh, butter. Another example. This is a word where most of the syllables actually have syllabic consonants as the nucleus rather than vowels. So the first syllable is E, 
that's something that that's a plain syllable. It's got no onset, no coda. It only has the nucleus, the vowel e, the high front unrounded vowel, and then ter, and then null. What is that? Eternal. This is an interesting example. This is why it's important to mark the syllabic consonants with a little mark when you're doing a transcription. The first one has a syllabic consonant n, so that's going to be an entire syllable formed just of the consonant n. And it is lion. Lion. First syllable y, second syllable n. Lion. Versus line, which is the thing you draw like this. So the first one is the roaring creature in the savanna. The second one is the thing you draw on a whiteboard or something. Lion versus line. The only difference there is that in the first case the n is syllabic, in the second case it's not. You also find many examples in other languages where these syllabic nasals are super common. So in English, these syllabic consonants typically don't occur at the beginning of a word. They're usually in one of the sort of later syllables in a word. But in Cantonese, for example, you have things like this. The word for five in Cantonese is on. It is a syllabic voiced velar nasal. On means five. That's a complete word. So that would consist of empty onset, empty coda, and the nucleus is the syllabic consonant ang. And the word for excuse me, like if you bump into someone in a crowd, you have to say excuse me in Cantonese is mgoi, where the first syllable is a syllabic m. So that's syllables. So just to review, a syllable is a unit of sound in terms of the, the phones as they're produced in the speech stream consisting of two parts, an onset and a rhyme. A rhyme consists, in turn, of a nucleus and a coda. The onset and the coda are both sequences of consonants. The nucleus is either a vowel or a syllabic consonant, which is marked with this line under the syllable, under the symbol, rather, in the transcription. Nasals and approximants can be syllabic consonants in English. If you start looking at other languages, you can even find cases where things like fricatives and stops serve as syllabic consonants, but that's pretty rare across languages, and it certainly doesn't happen in English. And you should think about what that might sound like. Just think about what that might sound like, and uh, it's a lot of fun. Okay, we're done with syllables. And now the last thing I'm going to cover in phonetics, this is going to complete the IPA chart. After this, you're going to understand everything on that chart. The last thing I'll cover is supersegmental features. So guess where they fit on the chart? Supersegmental features are the last part of the chart here. In order to explain what a supersegmental feature is, we're going to have to analyze the word supersegmental. Remember, when we say analyze, we mean break into parts. So what are the parts here? These are called supersegmental features. Well, you might notice that the word supersegmental, it has this word in it, segment. What do we mean by segment? A segment refers to an individual speech sound in the speech stream. So when I say a word like cats, we say that consists of four segments. K, A, T, and S. So a segment refers to an individual speech sound as you locate it in the speech stream. A segmental feature, then, is a feature like voicing, place of articulation, manner of articulation, which applies to one segment. So in the segment, in the series of segments, cats, the um, first consonant there is an unvoiced velar stop. And that feature of being unvoiced and velar and a stop, that only applies to that segment cut. It doesn't like also apply to other segments that happen to be there it doesn't apply to multiple segments at the same time. So a supersegmental feature is something which applies over a segment. It's something which applies to multiple segments at the same time, typically to segments that are adjacent to each other in the speech stream. So let's take a look at some examples. The most common example of a supersegmental feature, the one which plays the biggest role in English at least, is stress. So in many languages, not just English, in many languages, a syllable can be either stressed or unstressed. So this feature of stress is something which applies to a whole syllable. It applies to multiple features, and so it's called supersegmental. A stressed syllable is louder than a normal syllable, and it carries more emphasis. 
So some examples of this in English. I'm going to um, show some examples here of transcriptions which are annotated for stress. Stress is marked with a little mark before the stress syllable. And otherwise, syllables are separated by a dot. So let's take a look. We have the first thing here, which is the word insight in English. So the syllable in there, you see the stress mark, is stressed, followed by the syllable sight. The second example there is in sight, a different word in English distinguished only by the stress. First syllable is in, second syllable is sight with stress, stress applying to the entire syllable. Another example, the English word photograph, here's the phonetic transcription. It's first the stressed syllable pho, and then r, and then graph, photograph. And then just to show you what a big influence stress has on words, Here's another related word in English, photography. Now the stress is on the second syllable. We have f, and then a stress ta, and then a gr, and then a fi. So we're going to have a lot more to say about stress when we get to phonology. You see that when the stress moves around in English, the sounds actually also change a bit when you look at these transcriptions. And that's the kind of thing we're going to be talking about quite a bit when we get to phonology. So let's do some practice in identifying stress. I'm going to show you some transcribed words. I'd like you to tell me which syllable has the stress. So first of all, you're going to have to read the word phonetically. We have America. America. So where should I put the stress mark? What syllable gets the stress mark if I'm transcribing speech, English speech? Second syllable, America. What about this? Phonetics. Phonetics. That's what I've written here. Which syllable gets the stress? Again, it's the second one. Rectangle. So where does the stress go? Rectangle. Which syllable has the stress? It's the first. Rectangle. You should try to read this. This is a word with a bunch of syllabic consonants. Curtain. Curtain. Where's the stress? First syllable. Here is a word that you should be very familiar with, although the way it's written is maybe not familiar to you. So we start with a syllabic er, and then we have mm, I, n, mm, Irvine. This is uh, where your university is, even if it isn't where you are right now. And uh, where's the stress? Which syllable is the stress on? Is it on the first syllable er or the second syllable I, Irvine? First syllable. So the stress mark would go before the er there. So that's enough stress. Now, tone is the second major supersegmental feature that you see used across languages. It doesn't really play a big role in English, but it does in other languages. There's, in many languages, the tone of a syllable, which refers to the pitch at which the syllable is pronounced, actually matters for the meaning of the word being said. So a language that uses tone as a supersegmental feature in this way is what's called a tone language. So for example, in Mandarin Chinese, these are four different words, which um, and as far as the um, usual phonetic features are concerned, are pronounced the same, all pronounced ma. When you consider the supersegmental feature of tone, they're all pronounced differently. So the first one is ma, second one is ma, third is ma, third is ma. Four different words with four different meanings. In Mandarin Chinese, for example, the first one means mother, the second one means to scold, the third one means horse. And these, uh, the tone, the actual pitch at which the sound is produced, is a feature which separates words from one from another in languages like Mandarin. And here's how you would indicate the tone using the International Phonetic Alphabet. The International Phonetic Alphabet gives you a number of these special symbols, these little thingies that indicate the contour of the tone. The first one here is high tone, ma, and the little thing there indicates that it's high tone. The third one indicates a tone which starts low, goes even lower, and then goes high, as you can see with that sequence of three symbols there. So that's ma, and that's how you indicate tone in the International Phonetic Alphabet. So although English is not a tone language, and so it's hard for an English speaker to learn a language like this, uh, these tone languages are actually really common across the world. They're not just you know, located in East Asia. So what I have here is actually a map of the world, and 
Each circle corresponds to a language, and white circles mean a language that doesn't use tone, like English. A purple circle means a language which um, uses tone in a restricted way, which I'll explain momentarily. And red circles indicate languages which are full tone languages, languages where the tone of a syllable changes the meaning of the syllable. Now, you might be looking at this and wondering, like, what are all these dots in North America? Which one of those is English? Well, the dots here indicate the place of origin of a language. English is the dot that's sort of over London in this picture. All those dots in North and South America indicate the native languages that currently are or were spoken in that area. So we see that the tone languages are really common. They're actually mostly concentrated, uh, not only in East Asia, but also Sub-Saharan Africa and also Central America, the red ones. So the pink ones indicate what are called pitch accent languages. That's languages that have stress and where the stressed syllable also is pronounced with a higher tone. So you can think of those as sort of mildly tonal languages if you want. So for example, Japanese is on this list. So the pitch accent languages are also quite common. There's even some in Europe. Tone languages, full tone languages, are those where the tone of each syllable matters for the meaning expressed by that syllable. And now the last super segmental feature that I want to talk about is length, the length of a segment. Length is just the time that's taken to articulate a segment. Again, this is something we don't really use in English in order to distinguish between meanings, but we do have long and short sounds in English. It's just that we don't use that distinction in order to signal a difference in meaning. You do actually have other languages, though, where length does matter for signaling a difference in meaning. Length is called a supersegmental feature because length is relative to the other segments in a sequence of segments. Here's some examples from the Finnish language where length matters for distinguishing words one from another. So the word for mud is muta, everything is short. The word for some other, like some other person, the sort of determiner there is muta with a long u. So the difference between muta and muta is just the length of the u. Uh, similarly, muta, the third example there, has a long t. So this is actually written in the Finnish writing system as a doubled tt, or what's called a geminate t. But phonetically what's going on is that it's a long consonant. So muta means but. So muta, muta, and muta, three words are distinguished only by the lengths of the various consonants and vowels. And that's why you need to annotate length in your phonetic transcriptions. Other examples, uh, tapan is the verb, means I kill in Finnish. And then tapan means I meet. Very important to distinguish those two if you're talking about someone. Uh, these, the last triplet here would be the tule, which means come, like an imperative. I'm saying to you, come here. That would be tule. The verb tule, with a long vowel, would mean he or she comes. And tule with a long u and a long a means it's windy. So that's length. So supersegmental features are features which go beyond an individual segment. The major supersegmental features are stress and tone and length. Stress syllables are louder and carry more emphasis. Tone indicates the pitch of a syllable. And long segments are pronounced with more duration relative to other segments, and that's indicated with those two sort of dots that you saw in those examples previously. So we're done with phonetics now. We're done with articulatory phonetics. You now know how to at least describe all of these sounds in the languages of the world. So just take a moment and think about how cool that is. Uh, if you have been paying careful attention, you even know how to pronounce all of the sounds in all the languages of the world. That's pretty good. So where are you going to see phonetics going forward? Not just in this class, but where are you going to see phonetics in your life? How can you apply this skill that you've learned of phonetic analysis and of using the international phonetic alphabet? Well, it's going to help you read pronunciations. So for example, on Wikipedia, the pronunciations are given in the international phonetic alphabet. 
And I've heard a lot of people say, oh, I don't know how to read those pronunciations on Wikipedia. It's written in some weird alphabet. Well, now you know how to read the pronunciations on Wikipedia. Now you know how this thing says you should pronounce the, the name of this sauce, whose pronunciation is mysterious to many English speakers. It says Worcestershire sauce. Now you can read your Wikipedia pronunciations. And in general, any really careful dictionary or scientific, um, any formal description of a language is going to have give just give um, phonetic descriptions in the International Phonetic Alphabet. Another place where you see the IPA and where you see phonetics would be if you want to become a singer, if you want to go into music. Suppose that you are a singer and you want to sing this aria here in Russian, but you don't know Russian, you don't know how to read Russian. Well, uh, many, especially opera uh, librettos are given in International Phonetic Alphabet. So as a singer, you learn the International Phonetic Alphabet so that you can sing in any language. So here a phonetic transcription is given uh, for, the, uh, for this song in Russian. You would be able to sing this even if you don't know Russian because you know the International Phonetic Alphabet. Phonetics is also crucially, crucially important if you go into speech therapy. And if you do so, you're actually going to learn an extended form of the IPA. So if you want to describe all the sounds that someone with a speech disorder might produce, then it, you're going to have to learn a lot of other, you know, various kinds of manners of articulation, places of articulation that you never thought were possible. So there's an extended international phonetic alphabet, which is used for what's called disordered speech. And so, for example, this has things like linguolabial consonants. That's where your tongue is touching your lips, like ta. So that's very interesting. If you are um, trying to uh, deliver speech therapy to someone, one of the things you do is you have to carefully transcribe what they are actually saying. So you can diagnose the sounds they're having trouble with, so you can help them get better. And so that's why you need the extended IPA. So if this was really interesting to you, you want to learn more, you think phonetics is fun, you're obsessed with sounds now, then here's some stuff you can check out, some courses you can take. So here at UC Irvine, in our language science major, we have a number of courses. We have Intro to Phonetics, we have French Phonetics, we have Forensic Phonetics. This last one's really cool. This is like, what if you receive, uh, what if you receive a threatening phone call or something and you're working for law enforcement and you have to figure out who was talking? What are the characteristics of the person who was talking? That's forensic phonetics. It actually mostly involves acoustic phonetics. Still very interesting. You can also check out this interactive IPA chart. It has recordings at this link. You just click the symbol and you can hear someone pronouncing that sound. It's very fun. And there's also this thing called the UCLA Phonetics Lab Archive. This has um, examples of sounds, of all the different sounds in the IPA. There's also uh, a speech accent archive run by George Mason University. This consists of phonetic transcriptions and recordings from people from all over the world reading a certain standardized text. This text is designed to sort of bring out all the interesting aspects of the accents across the world. And so you can go to this site, you can look at transcriptions, you can read, you can uh, listen to recordings, and you can really get a sense for the actual fine-grained differences among accents. So what is it that makes an accent sound like Southern? in the US, there's certain phonetic signatures that you can detect in a narrow transcription like you see here. So that's a very fun way to get into phonetics and also broaden your understanding of dialects. So that's it for phonetics. Next time we'll start talking about phonology. <laughs>